For today, what are we doing? Well, it's sort of a time to catch our breath, do a little bit of practice. So we've learned a lot of geometrical techniques about applications. So we've done things like volume, uh, surface area, arc length. So we're going to just practice some of these things. And the next time we meet, which will be later this week, we'll move into physics applications. And uh, so you're probably like, ah, you should have taught this to us a couple of weeks ago. Then we would have done great in our physics class. Well, but now you'll know it this time. You'll be in great shape. So uh, we'll do some problems. Some of these are easier than others. And, uh, but you know, it's good to challenge yourself because that's how you know if you've learned the material. If you can say, look, I'm not afraid of a challenge. I'll take the challenge on. So here we go. Our first example. Find the length of the curve y equals e to the x, where x goes between log of square root of 3 and log of square root of 99. Now those are some very suspicious numbers, but uh, probably by the time we finish we'll see, okay, they probably gave us these suspicious numbers for a good reason. Now, the first thing you do when you see a problem is you have to figure out what type of problem am I doing? So looking at this problem, what's the key word here? Yeah, length. That helps us. So that tells us we're doing a length problem. So now that we were able to decode what they want us to do, we say, all right, I know what type of problem I want. The next thing is write down the right formula. So for right now, we only have one formula for length. We will actually get some more. So by the time the next exam rolls around, we'll have three different formulas for length, not because there's going to be three different ways to measure length, but because we're going to move into different settings on how to describe our function curves. So the formula we have now for length is you integrate from where you start to where you stop the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared and dx. And if you think about sort of the intuition of what this means is you have your curve and you can imagine you've zoomed in on your curve. So this is a piece of your curve. So this length here is your dx. This length, that should be how much your function has changed. Well, to know how much your function has changed, it's approximately f prime of x times dx. Because it's the rate of change. And that rate of change is f prime of x times the amount of change, which is the dx. So the rise is approximately f prime of x dx. And of course, that approximation gets very good in the small, which means that you say, all right, it looks like a triangle. And so this last side, by the Pythagorean theorem, you square this, you square that, and you take the square root. Well, all the terms have a dx, so you can pull it out. So it becomes the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So this is, you know, if you're on an exam and you're like, I'm having a hard time remembering the formula, just rederive it. No, that doesn't take too long. Probably it's better to remember these things. Um, but, you know, worst case scenario, we can always figure it out. So this is our function f of x. So let's write down what we have. Our length will be the integral from log root 3 to log root 99, because that's given to us. And hopefully those become nicer numbers by the time we're done. The square root of 1 plus, and what's the derivative of e to the x? Yeah, it's e to the x. And then we're going to square it. What's another way to write e to the x squared? e to the 2x. E to the 2x. All right. So, now we have our setup. So, if this were an exam, and uh, we do have an exam coming in the near future, oftentimes on the second exam in our course, most of the points are involved in setting things up. So, we've had exams in the past where out of 70 points, you can get 45 out of 70 without ever doing a single integral because we care about the setup. So you really want to make sure I know how to set things up. 
And in case you're wondering, 45 would put you above the average on this most recent exam. So, so even if you can't integrate, at least set things up. And even if you can integrate, you better set things up because otherwise you're doing the wrong integrals and you won't get points. So the moral is, make sure you know how to set things up. Now we come to the issue. How can we integrate this thing? Well, there are, it's not so obvious, it's definitely not one of our 10 basic integrals. And so substitution. All right, substitution has been suggested. And uh, anyone have a suggestion? Yeah, 2x. 1 plus e to the 2x. 1 plus e to the 2x, okay, that's aggressive. Can we be even more aggressive? So it's like, be aggressive, be e aggressive, right? Well, what's like the most aggressive substitution you can make? Yeah, let's just do the entire thing. Why not, right? Worst case scenario, it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. We try something else. That's the philosophy. We try something. It's better than trying nothing. All right. Now, I don't know if this is going to work, by the way, but I'm interested to find out. So let's see what happens. Okay. U equals the square root of 1 plus e to the 2x dx. Oh, uh, sorry. Just, that dx isn't coming yet. Uh, just there. Now, that is, on a side note, the same thing as saying that u squared equals 1 plus e to the 2x. Yes? Because I just square both sides. All right. Now let's take derivatives. The derivative of u squared, what would that give us? 2u du. How about the derivative of 1 plus e to the 2x? 2e to the 2x dx. Okay. Hey, good news. Uh, this looks promising. The 2s cancel. Woohoo! All right. Now, at this point, you're saying, Steve, you're stuck. You have an e to the 2x there. And there's no e to the 2x left for you to substitute. Aren't we stuck? Hmm. Now, one thing that would be great, well, we could certainly do the following. I can move the e to the 2x across. I could say that dx, that's equal to u du divided by e to the 2x. And what I'd like to do is say, can I somehow write e to the 2x just in terms of u? No x is involved. So is there some way I can replace e to the 2x with just u stuff? u squared minus 1. See? We got that relationship. Okay, so that's u du over u squared minus 1. And now we're like, ah, it's beautiful. Okay, so let's see what we have. It's the integral. This square root of 1 plus e to the 2x becomes? It becomes u, because that's how we, we did our substitution. The dx, well, that's down here. That's u over u squared minus 1 du. All right, anything else we need to do? Bounds. Bounds. Okay, so now, hmm, bounds might take us a second. Let's think what happens. All right, so I'm going to go sort of backwards. So remember how we said u equals the square root 1? I'm going to recall that this is e to the x quantity squared. Just because I see square roots, I'm, I'm anticipating something to happen. So let's plug in log of root 3 and see what happens. So at x equals log of root 3, we get u equals the square root of 1 plus e to the log of root 3 squared. So let's start unraveling this, this onion. e to the log, what does that do? Okay. They essentially undo each other, like they cancel each other out. So if I have e to the power log of something, it's just a something. So this inside part becomes root 3. But now there's a square. What does that make it? Makes it 3. Add 1, 4. And then we take the square root of that, gives us 2. Oh, that's a nice number. That's a terrible number. That 
I can live with. Well, how about log of square root of 99? Can you see what that becomes? What was it? 10. It's 10. Yeah, because what will happen is you get square root of 99, because the e and the log will undo each other. Square, uh, sorry, square root of 99 squared is 99, plus 1 makes 100, which is a nice round number, makes it 10. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so now we've changed the problem into something which I think is better. At least it feels better. Now, what setting are we in? What's our technique from here? So we did a substitution. We've transformed our integral. Are we into an integral that we're comfortable with? That we have like, ah, I have the right tool for this. And if we do have the right tool, what is the right tool? I'll, I'll give you a second to think about what we need. At least I'll give you a fraction of a second. We have a lot to cover. It's partial fractions. It's partial fractions, right? It's a polynomial over a polynomial. U squared upstairs, U squared minus 1 downstairs. Now, so if we think of this as U squared over U squared minus 1, what's our first step? Well, we can't factor yet. What do we need to do if we have U squared over U squared minus 1? Long division because the power upstairs is at least as big as the power downstairs. Now, sometimes you can sort of do a cheat long division. Uh, what do I mean by a cheat long division? Well, u squared is really very close to u squared minus 1. How close is u squared to u squared minus 1? You're just minus 1 off, right? So you could do something a little sneaky. It's really sort of a hidden long division. You can say, well, the top is really, I meant to write it as u squared minus 1 plus 1. Now, you might say, why do that? Well, the minus 1 plus 1, that doesn't change anything. But you'll notice if I think of grouping it in this way, I, I have u squared minus 1 over u squared minus 1. And that simplifies nicely as 1. And then I have this part, which is 1 over u squared minus 1. OK, so if you did long division, you would get to this same point. So if you're comfortable with long division, do long division. Do what you're comfortable with. Don't think like, oh my gosh, I have to learn all these tricks. No. You have to get to a point where you're comfortable doing the problem. If you're comfortable with just saying, I only know a handful of things, I'm going to apply them, that's great. But if you're like, hey, I, I know how to bend the problem a little bit, that's cool too. The important thing is, do it right. Because uh, we don't award points for creativity. This isn't art history. You got to get the right answer. So, all right. Now, what's our next step? Yeah, now we need to factor. Does u squared minus 1 factor? It does factor. What does it factor as? u plus 1 and u minus 1. Okay, good, good, good. So now we come to the side and we switch. We're going to not do calculus for a few minutes. We're going to do algebra. All right, so what's our algebra? We have 1 over u plus 1 times u minus 1. And we say we want something over u plus 1. And we want something over u minus 1. Clear our denominators. 1, that's something, times u minus 1, uh, plus the other something times u plus 1. So this is our partial fractions. Hopefully you remember it. It'll come back at some point. Might be on the final. So you want to you remember these things. They're good things to know. What do we do now? Yeah, we pick good numbers, make good choices. Someone says, let's plug in 1. So let's plug in 1. If we pick u equals 1, lo and behold, 1 will equal, well, nothing times a and 2 times b. 2b. Well, we don't want 2b. We want b equals a half. Any other good choices? Negative 1. Negative, sorry, 1 haha, equals minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2a, and then the b terms goes away, 
So B equals minus a half. Sorry, A equals minus a half. Ah, sorry, sorry. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, now we did our algebra. So we go back and we update our integral. So integral 2 to 10 of, we still have the 1. And then this part breaks up as A, which is minus a half. I'll write that as minus a half over u plus 1. And then B, which is a half, and over u minus 1. All right, we're getting close. We're almost there. Now we actually do the integral. So everything before now that was set up and then simplify. And usually, if you do your job right and simplify, the actual integral is very straightforward. What's the integral of 1? u. What's the integral of minus 1 half times 1 over u plus 1? Minus a half, natural log, u plus 1. How about 1 half times 1 over u minus 1? Plus a half, log, u minus 1. If you feel comfortable putting absolute values, you can do that. And here it won't make a difference because we're, we're going from 2 to 10. And that doesn't change anything with the logs. Well, last thing to do is uh, plug it in, see what we get. So we plug in 10. So that'll be 10 minus 1 half natural log of 11 plus 1 half natural log of 9. So I just plug in u equals 10. Subtract. Plug in u equals 2. 2 minus 1 half natural log of 3 plus 1 half natural log of 1. All right. Can we simplify anything? Yeah. Natural log of 1 is 0. Good. Good. Uh, other things, what can we do? The 2 and the 10, yeah. So 10 minus 2 is also known as 8. True story. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of logs. Uh, let's see, what do we have? I'll write it as plus 1 half, and let's see what logs we have. We have a, a plus 1 half, there's a, a log 9. Notice this minus here will go in. And remember, parentheses are important. Parentheses, they save points. That really comes a plus a half, so there's really a plus, a log 3. And then there's a minus log of 11. Now, can we do anything with these logs? If we wanted to. You'd still get the right answer, by the way, if you stopped here. But, you know, it's fun to say, how far can we go? We could combine the logs, right? And how does it work? It works by saying, if I have things multiplying, well, sorry, if I have things which are being added, you multiply them on the numerator. If I have things being subtracted, they could get multiplied, but where? Denominator. So we have 9 times 3, which is 27, and then we divide that by 11. So we're going to get a log of 27 over 11. Now, what can you do with the half, just if you want to have fun and confuse people? We can bring it in as a square root. So 8 plus the log of square root 27 elevenths. Exactly what you probably thought it was going to be, right? <laughs> no! You never would have guessed that number. But we don't have to guess. We've got the power of math on our side. And math is a wonderful, wonderful ally. All right. Let's try another one. Find the volume which results from rotating the region where we go from 0 to pi for x, so 0 up to pi, and from a half x, which is this line, up to a half x plus sine x, which is that line, around the x-axis. And, and look at that. They, they gave us like the whole picture. They're being very nice. And in general, we will give you pictures on exams, because we like giving you pictures. The goal, this is not a drawing class. That's, that's a different type of, of class. 
Our goal is to see, can you do the math? Now, what's the key word here? Yeah, the key word here is volume. So you know it's a volume problem. When you see volume, there are three things that can happen for volume. One is you have really weird cross sections. Like they say, oh, a cross section looks like a triangle or a cross section looks like a square. That's not this kind of problem. See, not only is it a volume problem, but what do we know? It's, it's being a rotated. So that's another keyword. So this means it's a volume of revolution. Now, when you have volume of revolution, how many different ways do we have to find that volume? There's two. All right, there's the washer method or disk method, depending if there's no hole, and there's shell method. And before you start, it, it's not entirely clear which method to use. And oftentimes, in many cases, you can use both, but not all the time. So let's think about what's the right method for us to be using. Now, the way to figure it out is we look at this and say, hey, I see this is given to me as a function of x. So I want to integrate with respect to x. Because as it is right now, if I wanted to integrate with respect to y, I'd have to somehow figure out how do I solve for x if I say half x plus sine x equals y. And the answer is I'm never going to. It can't be done. So I know I'm integrating with respect to x. That says when I think of how I find my pieces, I think of taking a small strip. And so if I'm integrating with respect to x, it's going to be a small vertical strip. And the reason it's a small vertical strip is you think of a small change, so, so that the width here is your dx. So that's what's happening. So when you have dx, you really are splitting things up into small vertical pieces. And when you have dy, it's a small change in y. So that's a small horizontal strip. And now to figure out what technique you use, you say, OK, let me just spin just that one little piece. And as we spin that one little piece around, lo and behold, we see a certain shape emerge. And that shape tells us what method we use. What's our shape? It's a washer. Therefore, we're going to use the washer method. OK, good. So now we know what technique we're using. All right. So now we just have to do it. So we say, what's the generic formula? Well, it's a to b. There's a pi. Oftentimes, it happens when you're doing things with circles. And really, we're forming circles here. And the way the washer works is you say, well, I'm thinking as there's a big circle, and I'm pulling out a little circle. So it's going to be pi. And then there's what I like to call outer radius squared. And then I subtract the inner radius squared. And then I have my thickness. So this is, this is how I think of my formula. All right. And it sort of say, it takes a big circle, subtract the small circle. That's the area of the washer. Times it by your thickness. That's going to be your dx in this case. That's the volume of my little piece. Integration says add them up. And now I have my formula. Life is good. So we actually know a couple of things about this. We've already talked about things. We talked about the thickness. That's our dx. Um, where are we integrating from? 0 to the pi. That'll be almost always given to us, or easy to figure out. And this pi is still pi. True story. So now we come to these little pieces. We have to figure out what's the outer radius, radius and what's the inner radius. And we have to work with that. So what do we mean by outer radius? Well, you go to where you spin around, and you say, OK, how far is it up to the further distance, the piece that's further away? So which piece is further away? Is it the half x or the half x plus sine x? Yeah, it's the half x plus sine of x. That's the piece that's further away. The inner radius, again, you start from your, where you spin around, and you go to the piece that's closer. What's that? The half x. And that's the setup. Now we're set up. The rest of this is going to be fun integration. So let's do some fun integration. This will be integral 0 to pi. We have the pi. What do we do next? 
yeah, we should, we should expand. At this point, our goal is either we can integrate it or we need to simplify it. Those are our two options. And when, when I say we can integrate it, I mean like we can integrate without thinking. It should be like, ah, this is a ha. You, you, you actually say things when, instead of like, ah. Oh. But we're not at that stage. So we are in the simplify stage. So we use algebra. We have a square, so we square it. So that would be what? 1 fourth x squared. Then what comes next? OK, x sine x, good, because when you square, you have your, like, your a squared, then it's your 2ab, and then? Plus sine, squared. sine squared x, good. And that's, we're going to be subtracted, or uh, rather, we're going to subtract 1 fourth x squared. All right, can we do anything nice? Aha, uh -huh. the part that's easy for us to integrate will cancel that out. Good, leaving us with the parts which are not so easy. Well, but they're not so impossible. How about sine squared? What do we do to integrate sine squared? No. Power reduction, yes, that's right, good. So do you remember what power reduction says this is? One minus cosine two x over two. How do you integrate x sine x? If this is an important part to this problem. Integration by parts. Good. Let's, uh, let's do it over here on the side, just to remind ourselves. x sine x dx. So integration by parts says, well, there's just two parts here, so those are our two candidates. Which part do we want to differentiate? Which part do we want to integrate? So let's start with which part do we want to differentiate? x. Because if we differentiate x, it gets better. Whereas if we differentiate sine x, it just gets different. It doesn't get better or worse, it just becomes slightly different. Okay, so that's u, that's dv, du, that's nice, dx. Integral of sine? Negative, Negative cosine. Yep. So this becomes uv minus x cosine x minus the integral of v du. So minus minus cosine x dx. Well, minus minus makes it plus. Integral of cosine? Integral of cosine is sine. Okay, so there's sort of a little off to the side note. So we now can actually carry out this integral. So we'll have a pi. The integral of x sine x is this part right here. So minus x cosine x plus the sine x. We don't need the plus c because we're going to do a definite integral. Now uh, we're left with this part. The integral of a half, what would that be? The integral of a half would be one half x. Integral of minus cosine two x divided by two. Okay, definitely sine two x, and then someone said a one fourth. I agree with that. Where did the one fourth come from? Well, there's part of it came from that two. The other part came from the other two, because when you integrate, you have to compensate. Plus or minus? Is it plus? Is it minus? Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, will it make a difference? The answer is no. It actually doesn't matter, because it's going to all zero out. But we want to get the right answer. Because I have known in the past that the graders are very particular. And if you write down something which is not true, you might lose a point. OK, so what is it, plus or minus? It is indeed a minus, yes. Good. Evaluate that from 0 to pi. We're almost there. OK, so we have a pi. We have minus pi. What is cosine of pi? Cosine of pi is negative 1. So if I have minus pi times minus 1, that's actually a positive pi. That's nice. Uh, sine of pi is 0. 1 half times pi is a half times pi. Sine of 2 pi. 0 is correct. 0. Good. So that's when we plug in pi. Subtract. Let's plug in 0. Minus 0 times cosine of 0. Well, cosine is zero. I don't care. There's a zero there. 
Gone. Okay. Sine of zero? Zero. Half times zero? Zero. Sine of zero? Still zero. Okay, well, that's good. So pi plus a half pi, that's three halves pi. There's another pi there. So we get three halves pi squared. And that's the answer. Ah, oh, that was good. Nice. Cool. All right. Let's try another one. Find the surface area when the curve y equals two-thirds x to the three-halves is rotated around the y-axis. Well, they didn't give us a picture, but we can, of course, imagine this. Two-thirds x to the three-halves. I, I don't know. It does something vaguely like that. Uh, it's easy to see it's zero at zero, and it's getting bigger. So let's say this is at three. And we're rotating around the y-axis. That's this axis over here. OK. So. Good. Now, what's our key word when we see this problem? Surface area. Cool. See how easy it is to identify problems? You just like read it, and it's trying to tell you things. And so this is good to know. Okay, so we have surface area. Now, that one, hopefully you remember that. We just barely did that one. Let's see. Can you remember the formula? Well, I'll start at surface area. You integrate from A to B. That's not a surprise. What comes next? 2 pi is correct. And then? The radius. And this is sort of the mysterious one. I, I like to say, what's in the box? What's in the box? Because that one, you got to think about. Now, what's the rest of it look like? Square root 1 plus f prime x squared dx. But this part right here, really, this is just a fancy way of saying length. So it's 2 pi, the radius, and the length. Now the length is the same length formula we've already saw earlier today. Now how do you figure out the radius? Well, what you do is you say, let's just think of a little tiny piece. Because everything works by working with a little tiny piece. So there's my little tiny piece, and I want to spin it. So I'm spinning it around the y-axis. So that says my radius is this distance here. How far that little tiny piece is from the y-axis. So if I'm thinking of this piece as its current location is at x, so this is at, located at x comma f of x, what is the distance to the y-axis? It's x in this case. So you have to always think about where you're spinning. Because the radius is the one that's tricky. Because sometimes it's x, sometimes it's f of x. It can also be other things as well. If you're spinning around like the line y equals 5, well, that becomes something else as well. So you just have to think about that. So in our case, it's going to be x. So we're pretty good. We've got a lot of this set up. OK, so we're integrating 0 to 3, 2 pi x. And now we have the square root of 1 plus, well, let's uh, do the derivative. This one we might be able to do in our head. What's the derivative of 2 thirds x to the power of 3 halves? It would become x to 1 half, or square root of x. And now the, our formula says you better square that. If you square that, what do you end up with? You end up with x. OK, dx. So now, that's what we need to integrate. All right, well, what can we do? Is it possible to integrate this one? Probably if we ask you to do it, it's possible. If you just randomly try it, you know, if you and a friend just sit down and say, let's just make up a function, it's not going to work. It's hard to get things which are actually going to work because it's very delicate, integration is. So what can we do? Now, I don't want to say that like there's only one thing you can do. But. OK. Uh, well, in the interest of wanting to do more problems, let's just do a, a substitution. But we're not going to do an aggressive substitution this time. We'll just let 1 plus x be u. That's not so bad. 
So if u equals x plus 1 or 1 plus x, what does du equal? dx. It feels like we've hardly done anything. In fact, really all we've done is do a, a, a small shift. So for instance, our bounds from 0 to 3 would become bounds from where to where? 1 to 4, because we just are adding 1 to the x. So if x was 0, now it's 1. If x was 3, now it's 4. The 2 pi will become 2 pi. Two pi. What about this x? What will that become? u minus 1. All right, the square root of 1 plus x, square root of u. And the dx, du. Now, these integrals are essentially the same, just one has been slightly shifted. But the second one looks a little bit better. What would you do on the second integral? Is there a question? Um, where did you get the u minus 1 from? The u minus 1, where did that come from? The u minus 1 came from taking this relationship here and solve for x. So x is u minus 1, because there's an x here. And whenever you do a substitution, you have to remember, you always have to account for every x, every single one. So that includes the dx, and that includes the bounds. So that x didn't get caught by anything else. We had to make a, a change. OK, so here, hmm, the 2 pi, if we want, we can actually pull that to the outside. That's the constant, 1 to 4. And then square root of u, that's more of an algebra thing to say square root of u. We want to do a calculus thing. So we say u to the half. We'll multiply that through. So that'll become u to the 3 halves minus u to the 1 half du. And now each one of these pieces, they're not so bad. Integral of u to the power of 3 halves. 2 fifths u to the 5 halves is correct. Integral of u to the 1 half. Spoiler alert, it's kind of over here. Two-thirds u to the three-halves. Good. From one to four. Now, we just have to evaluate. So, four to the five-halves. Well, that's not so bad. Four to the fifth, as we all know, is 1,024. And the square root of 1,024 is, of course, we say it all together, 32. Oh, yes, somebody got it. Oh, yes, good, 32. Ah, you're catching up. Of course, that's not how we really do it. How do we really do it? Well, if I have 4 to the 5 halves, do the half first. 4 to the 1 half two. is 2. And 2 to the 32, the good news is you have fingers. You just use your fingers. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So, okay, so that's 32. Uh, 4 to the 3 halves. 8. Okay, and then we're going to subtract 1. Well, 1 to any power is 1. So it's 2 fifths and 2 thirds. Now, if we wanted to go further, because, hey, we're adventurous, what would be our next thing to do? Common denominator. Yes. OK, so this would be 2 pi. And I'll probably regret this in about f five seconds from now. Everything's over 15. OK, so what do I have to multiply the 5 by to get to 15? 3. So I have 2 times 32, which is 64. If I multiply 64 times 3, we get 192. Right? 60 times 3 is 180. 4 times 3 is 12. Put them together, get 192. OK, next term. What do I have to multiply the 3 by to get up to 15? 5. Here I have 2 times 8 times. I'm going to multiply that by 5. What will that get me up to? 80. And there's a minus, so minus 80. OK, this one's simpler. Uh, I have 5. To get up to 50, we need 3. So what is that going to give me? Give me 6 upstairs, plus or minus 6? Minus. OK, here I have 2 thirds multiplied by 5. What will that get me? Upstairs. 10. And pay attention to the sign, plus 10. OK, so that's not so bad. We have uh, 192. If I subtract 80, that would give me 112. If I subtract 6, that would give me 106. If I add 10, that's 116. 
But remember, we also have the 2. So 116 times 2, 232 divided by 15 pi. Now, does that simplify any further? Yes. No. That's it. 232 is not divisible by 3. And it's not divisible by 5 either. Now, it's, in case you're wondering, how do I know it's not divisible by 5? That is a 2. That's the, my hint. If it's divisible by, by 5, the last digit has to be either 0 or 5. How can I tell it's not divisible by 3? Do you know that one? You add up the digits. And if that number is not divisible by 3, the original number is not divisible by 3. Well, if you add the digits, you get 7. And 7 is not divisible by 3. Oh, you guys are good. They're, they teach you some fun stuff. Maybe there's hope for the next generation. Okay. All right. Next one. Find the volume which results from rotating the region 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1, and 0 less than or equal to y, less than or equal to 2 over x plus 1 times x squared plus 1 around the line x equals 1. So the good news is they gave us a picture. And so we're going to end up with, it's going to rotate and it's going to form a shape. Okay. Now, what's our technique? Well, what should we be integrating with respect to? X or Y? X. X. And why do we do that? Because this is a function of X. And so if they give you something which is a function of X, integrate with respect to X. If they give you something which is a function of Y, integrate with respect to Y. Unless they tell you to do something strange. Okay, so we take our little slice, we spin our little slice. Do, 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 do. Here we spin around. Do, do. Okay, what's our shape? It's a shell. So what's our method? <coughs> shell method. And uh, of course I forgot to highlight that this is a volume and it's something from rotating. So if you see words like rotate and volume, you know it's either shell or, or washer. Okay, so next thing we need to do is, uh, well, we need to, I don't think we've done a, a wash, or sorry, a shell method today. So let's write down our formula. Volume is integral A to B. Now what comes next? 2 pi, and then the next piece is the radius, how far you are from where you spin, and the last thing is, well actually there's two more things, height, good, and thickness. Now we know a couple of these things, what's our thickness? That's our dx. Our height is the function. So it's from the top curve to the bottom curve. Well, in our case, the bottom curve is zero, so it's this function here. So 2 over x plus 1 times x squared plus 1. What's the radius in our case? So, so this is where we're spinning it. We say how far away are we from where we spin around. So we're spinning around not an axis, we're spinning around 1. So What's our distance, say, from x to 1? 1 minus x. That's our radius. The 2 pi is 2 pi, and our bounds? 0 to 1. So that is our formula. Okay, that's our setup, worth a lot of points. But of course, we don't want just a lot of the points. All the points, good. Got to get them all. Okay, so now we say we're ready to transition into integration. How do we integrate something like this? Partial fractions, exactly. Because the 2 pi, well, we can pull that out. That doesn't really matter. 0 to 1. Then you have your, uh, I'll say, 2 minus 2x. Divide that by x plus 1, x squared plus 1, dx. It's a polynomial over a polynomial. There wasn't any cancellation. Do we need to do any more factoring? No. No more factoring needs to happen. We've been factored out. Okay. 
So, time to transition to our algebra. Ah, oh, let's see if we can finish this in the time we have. 2 minus 2x over x plus 1, x squared plus 1, will be something over x plus 1 plus something else over x squared plus 1. What goes over the x plus 1? A. What goes over the x squared plus 1? Bx plus c. Wonderful. Good. Clear our denominators. Farewell, denominators. We don't need you anymore. 2 minus 2x equals a times x squared plus 1 plus bx plus c times x plus 1. Now, what can we do? We can pick some nice numbers, but that might help us. What's a nice number? Negative 1 is a great nice number, see, because negative 1 would zero out that last piece. So, plug in x equals negative 1. 2 minus 2 times negative 1, what will that give us? 4. Here we get a times negative 1 squared plus 1, that's 2a, and this last piece is 0. That tells us a equals 2. That's good. Is there any other nice numbers? Zero? Okay, let's try zero. It might work. X equals zero. Okay. Two minus zero. Two. Equals A. Well, what do we know about A? It's two. BX plus C becomes C and times one. So what does that tell us about C? C is zero. Okay. Good news is we have two of them. Well, what can we do now? Plug in any number we want. But make it a nice number. Just any number doesn't mean make it a terrible, you know, it's like plug in 137, no, no, one. Two minus two? Zero. Zero. Equals two times a. But I know what two times a is. That's four. Plus, I'll get b plus c, but b plus c will become just b, because the c is zero. And then I'll get times one, so four plus b. So what does that say about b? Negative four. Okay, so quickly here, so this is two pi, integral zero to one. We have a, which is two over x plus one, and then c is zero, so we get a minus four x over x squared plus one. Oh my gosh, this is so weird. This doesn't feel like a problem I would have written. What? Okay. 2b. Yes. So that's negative 2? Yes. So that's negative 2? Yes. Okay, 2 pi, 2 over x plus 1. Natural log of x plus 1. 2x over x squared plus 1. Do you know what that one is? There's a, there's, there's a 2 there. It'll be natural log of x squared plus 1. And evaluate from 0 to 1. So that's 2 pi. When we plug in 1, you get 2 log of 2 minus log of 2. And when you plug in 0, you get a log of 1 and a log of 1, which are both 0. So 2 log 2 minus log 2 is log 2. So you get 2 pi log of 2. OK. Nice. Good. Good. All right. Okay, let's uh, do one last problem, and here we go. So, we have this region, R, and it's bound by the curves y equals x, y equals 2 minus x, and y equals x squared. And there's two parts, A and B, and you'll notice these have some of the sweetest words in the calculus language. Set up. Well, why are they sweet? Because it says we have to set it up but we don't have to actually integrate it. Whew, nice. So this is all about practicing setting up integrals. So it says set up an integral or integrals to find the volume when r is rotated around the x-axis using the shell method. So let's think about how we're going to do that. So we want to rotate around the x-axis, that's this axis down here, and we want to use the shell method, which means that when we spin, we have to end up with shells. 
So there's two types of shapes. So one would be if we were to do horizontal slicing. The other would be if we were to do, sorry, this is vertical slicing. The other is horizontal slicing. So let's be careful and make sure we understand which is which. So when we do slicing like this, this is our DX type of slicing, small bit of X. And this type of slicing is our DY type of slicing. And so we're after the one which would give us the shell. So the question is, which one of these two pieces, if we rotate it on this axis, would form a shell? Now this piece, if you spin it, we can't fit it on the page, but you can see that what would happen is it would make a washer. So here, if we were to integrate this, this would turn out to be a washer method. All right, well, that's not right. That's part B. And here, if you spin it, what we're going to end up forming is going to be a cylinder or a shell. So that's what we need. This is our shell. So we are going to be doing our slices in this way. So for part A, we are going to integrate with respect to y. All right. Well, since we're integrating with respect to y, we, we need to make a couple of changes. So first off, we need to rewrite these equations, not as y is a function of x, but x is a function of y. Some of these equations are easier than others. For instance, y equals x, turns out, true story, is the same as x equals y. y equals 2 minus x, well, you can just swap the roles of x and y, and this is the same as saying that x equals 2 minus y. Oop, sorry. And now y equals x squared. I have to think about that one. Now the tempting thing is to say, take the square root. And the correct thing is to take the square root. But you have to be a little bit careful. Because when you take a square root, you always have to worry about the sign. Now notice that this part here has negative values for x. So that says I better have a negative square root of y. If I had the positive square root of y, that would have positive x values, but that's not where we're at. Now, there's one other thing to take note. The other thing to take note is when we're slicing with dy, we, we can see that up to a certain point, in fact, it's this point right here, and we'll put a little line here, up to this point, we see the x equals minus square root of y on one side, and then x equals 2 minus y on the other. After that, we get x equals minus square root of y, then x equals y. So that says we're going to have to split. So our integral will be split into two integrals. Now, do we have all our pieces? The answer is not quite. There's one more thing we need to figure out, which is where are these? So for instance, this is down here at 0. In fact, it turns out it's x equals 0 and y equals 0. Where is this? Well, this would correspond to a place when 2 minus y was equal to y. And it's not too hard to figure out. That would correspond to the value y equals 1. Now you have this corner up here. What is that? Well, that's where 2 minus y is the same as minus square root of y. Now, here, it's not so clear, at least not automatically clear. What does that give us? What's the right value? Now, you might see it and you say, oh, okay, that actually happens at y equals 4, and it does. Now, if you didn't see it right away, you can do various things. For instance, where do these curves intersect? Well, let's find the x-intersection. That would be where x squared would be equal to 2 minus x or x squared plus x minus 2 equals 0. And as often happens in our class, suspiciously often even, this factors. And it factors nicely, x plus 2, x minus 1. So we get x is either negative 2 or positive 1. Well, we're over here where x is negative. Plug in negative 2 into x squared, we get 4. So we have everything we need. So let's do part A. Now remember, our basic integral for volume is the integral, uh, I'll put c to d, just because we're integrating 
for y. Oftentimes we use c to d. No real reason why. So then we have 2 pi, and now we have radius, and now this part, which we usually call height, but you can also call it length instead of height if you wanted to. The important thing is just a measurement. And then there's a thickness. But again, length is like height. And so we say, all right, let's do, let's start down here. So from zero to one. So we have the integral zero to one, two pi. Now the radius. Well, the radius would be, I have my little slice. How far am I to where I'm spinning? The answer is y, because that's the length. All right, what's the length? The length is how far across this is. So I'm going from x equals y to x equals minus square root of y. So to find the length, you would take the difference. So it would be y minus minus square root of y. And the thickness, that's just sort of this little teeny tiny height, almost imperceptible. And that's our dy. And that would be the contribution from this lower part down here. Now we have to add to that the upper part. Starts at 1, goes to 4. Still has a 2 pi. Now, if I'm up here, what's my distance this time? See, down here, it was y. What is it here? It's still y. So I'm still going to the same axis. But what's changed? Well, now it's the right-hand side is this 2 minus y, and the left-hand side is still minus root y. So it's 2 minus y minus minus root y dy. And that would be our volume doing the shell method. All right, now that's part A. The fun continues because we have a part B. So let's remember, what's part B? Same thing, we're gonna find the volume, same region, same axis, different method, washer method. So, how do we do it? Well, we already saw that the washer method is gonna be this up and down. So it's a dx integral. So a to b pi, and then it's outer radius squared minus inner radius squared, and then you have your thickness. Now let's be careful here. Same thing that we were doing before. We look and say, if we ever see a change in behavior, in other words, one of the radiuses. And the answer is you actually do see a change here. See, before zero, the top is this curve y equals 2 minus x, and the bottom is this curve y equals x squared. But after zero, from zero to one, now the top is still 2 minus x, but the bottom is x. So anytime a bounding curve changes, that means you have to break the integral. So we're going to have to do two integrals twice the fun. Well, we just have to set up two integrals. Now, let's just remind ourselves a couple things. This was y equals 4, and we actually showed earlier x equals 2. And this 1, well, that was the y value, but it's actually also the x value. It's 1 comma 1. So, let's, uh, oh, sorry, not x equals 2. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Negative 2. Yeah, see? Negative 2. So, let's go left to right. So we're going to say the integral from negative 2 to 0. That's where we have a set of consistent behavior, pi. Now we have to do the outer radius. So the outer radius is from this curve to where we're spinning. So the outer radius is essentially the value of the function because it's the value of the function. So that would be 2 minus x being the top. So 2 minus x squared minus the inner radius, that's from the inner curve down to where we're spinning around. So that is x squared squared. The thickness, dx. So that's what happens when we take this 
left hand side. Now the right hand side, what is that going to be? Well, it'll be the integral 0 to 1, 0 to 1, pi. Now the outer radius, it's still the top curve, is still the same. So it's still 2 minus x squared, but the inner radius is changed. See, now it's this new curve, y equals x. So that's minus x squared dx. And that would find us the volume by the washer method. Now, one thing you might look at these two integrals and say, hey, these integrals are not the same. And they're not going to be, usually, but they don't have to be. The integrals are different, and the methods are different, but the answer would match if we were very patient and we worked it all out. But today, we don't have to be patient, and we don't have to work it out. We just have to set it up, and oftentimes, setting it up is the most important thing to do. And that is it for geometrical applications, and come back next time when we start doing physics. All right, have a good day. Bye.